All right, Hotep, how's everybody doing? Hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, and writer. Today is Saturday, May 19th, 2018. Saturday, May 19th, 2018. It's Malcolm X's uh, birthday, Malcolm X's 93rd birthday. And today is also the birthday of uh, Queen Sophia Charlotte. Queen Sophia Charlotte, who was the wife of King George III, and she was a uh, queen of Great Britain during the American Revolutionary War. She was of African descent as well, okay? So it's her birthday also today. All right, so I, I wanted to do this presentation. I saw uh, a lot of uh, comments about the royal wedding. I saw a lot of people posting about it. Uh, I didn't watch it live. I was in the bed. I wasn't getting up uh, for it. Okay. It was on MSNBC for about. I ain't watching the other live. I said, I'm not, I'm not watching that nonsense. Okay. Uh, I did see some clips when I was watching uh, AM Joy this morning, Joanne Reed, because she was there in England for it. But I saw African Americans commenting about it, about the wedding. And um, it seems that a lot of a lot of African Americans, you know, have forgotten how Great Britain got their money, how Great Britain got their wealth. Um, so that's one of the things we're going to talk about. Okay, so uh, this is not an attack on Meghan Markle. All right, now before she started dating Prince Harry, I didn't know who she was. Okay, she's an African American actress. I didn't know who she was. I found out the day she was on uh, Nickelodeon when she was a child, but this is not an attack on Meghan Markle. Um, but we're gonna deal with some history, okay? So everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page, invite your friends to tune in also, okay? We're gonna deal with some history. And from some of the comments I saw today, a lot of people really don't understand the history. This deals with the history of African people, the history of the transatlantic slave trade. Also deals with some of the history of the Africans known as the Moors as well, okay? So um, news1.com had an article. I'm going to share some different articles with you. Uh, news1.com had an article today. Here's why News One won't be covering one iota of the royal wedding. Here's why News One won't, won't be covering one iota of the royal wedding. They said, much love to Meghan Markle, but we won't celebrate these colonizers. Much love to Meghan Markle but we won't celebrate these colonizers. So when you actually understand the history of how Great Britain got the wealth that you saw displayed today, it was because of the exploitation and enslavement of millions of African people, our ancestors, but not just the enslavement of them, but then the colonization of African nations and Caribbean nations, whether you're talking about Nigeria, whether you're talking about Ghana, whether you're talking about Jamaica and the Caribbean, okay? And the extraction of wealth, okay? The impoverishment of the people. This is how Great Britain got the wealth that you see displayed today. So we have to be very clear on this, okay? So in, uh, I, I'm gonna, uh, first I'm gonna share a, a part of this article from news1.com. Then I want to go to this one from AtlantaBlackStar.com because see what a lot of people don't know is that yes, in Britain they outlawed the transatlantic slave trade, in well they outlawed the slave trade in 1833. They outlawed the importation of enslaved African people in 1807. But what people don't understand is the history that happened after that, because they did not pay reparations to the formerly enslaved Africans but they paid reparations to the former white slave owners. This is Great Britain, okay? And then we know that um, you've had 14 Caribbean nations uh, in 2014, 14 uh, Caribbean nations filed a lawsuit against Britain for damages it received through the, through, uh, the transatlantic slave trade. They're seeking reparations. OK, 14 Caribbean nations. This is this is something we're going to talk about because Britain has never apologized for this. They never apologized for this. OK, no, we're not even talking about saying we're going to think about paying records, reparations. They never even apologized for the damage inflicted upon Africa and Caribbean nations for the transatlantic slave trade. 
Okay, now this is not an attack on Meghan Markle. Please understand this. This is not an attack on her. But maybe it'd be nice if she'd speak up about this. Okay, but I'm talking about those who who de who are descendants of these colonizers. Okay, who have created, who have enjoyed this wealth for decades and 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 generations. Okay, centuries and generations. All right. So let's look at this article first from news1.com. Here's why news1 and news1.com is African American owned as Kathy Hughes, okay? Here's why news1 won't be covering one iota of the royal wedding. Much love to Meghan Markle, but we won't celebrate these colonizers, all right? So, it they talk about how um uh Prince Harry and Meghan Markle are marrying Saturday at Windsor's Castle in England, but while we are definitely here for Meghan Markle, she is someone we have never seen marrying into the royal family. American divorced, American divorced, and identifies as biracial. That isn't enough for us to give a damn about anything that has to do with this deeply problematic family with a serious history of racism. And racism and white supremacy go hand in hand. Expect this to be our last coverage of the weekend on these two saying, quote unquote, I do. Now this is written by News One staff, okay? News One staff. It says, why do we not care about the so-called royal family? Why do we not care about the so-called royal family? Because when you understand the history of these people, these, these were groups that came, that came from groups of Germanic people who were also called barbarians. They come from the Anglos and the Saxons and the Jutes. And the Anglos, the Saxons, the Jutes, the Lombards, the Picts, the Allens, the Franks, they have been fighting each other for hundreds of years. And they're going to organize themselves into nations. OK, we know that the, we know that uh, we know that uh, uh, England is named after the Anglos and the Anglos and Saxons come to Jamestown, Virginia in 1607. This is why some people refer to white people as white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, because the Protestant movement we know starts with Martin Luther, 1517. They break away from the Catholic Church. Right. OK, but this is what, what this was referring to. The Anglos and the Saxons were two groups. A, a, what are called Germanic people referring to Europeans, but they were also called barbarians. All right. And this deals with the whole medieval period after the fall of the Western portion of the Roman Empire in 476 AD. OK, now, first, they have blood on their hands. First, the, this royal family, they have blood on their hands. Yes, all of Europe is packed with bloody colonizers and conquering from sea to shining sea is not unique to the royals, but the wealth of the royal family, the wealth that the royal family has was built off of the African slave trade. And the guardian.com, the guardian.co.uk, the guardian, which is a, a, a UK publication, the guardian.co.uk reported back in 2004, quote, between 10 and 20, between 10 and 28 million Africans were forcibly sent to the Americas and sold into slavery between 1450 and the early 19th century. Okay, now it was much more than that. They, they're lowballing the numbers. They're lowballing the numbers. We know it was at least a hundred. It was at least a hundred million. You're dealing with about nine African nations, and we're dealing with those who died during raids, those who died on the way to the slave forts or slave dungeons. They were slave dungeons. That were along the coastal line, those that die in the slave dungeons, those that die on the ships, those that die. OK, so so we're dealing with at least 100 million. OK. And we're looking at from about 1440, when the Portuguese get involved in the transatlantic slave trade up until really about 1888, when slavery is abolished in Brazil. OK. All right. Now, by then, by, by the early 19th century. OK, they're saying early 19th century, but we have to understand also that slavery did not end in Brazil to about 1888. By then, Britain was the dominant trader, transporting more than 300,000 enslaved Africans a year in shackles on overcrowded and disease ridden boats. Now, I know there was a African-American Episcopal bishop there from Chicago when he said some eloquent words, but I don't I, I read some excerpts of what he said, but from what I read, he, he he talked about the slave trade, but he didn't he didn't call for reparations to be paid by Great Britain, by the, by the British Crown, by the monarchy. 
for what they inflicted upon African people in the Caribbean and African nations. OK, so this is not an attack on him either. And we're looking at this holistically and. We have to understand how many of our people sit up here and they're mesmerized by all this stuff. All right. But this is the result of the exploitation of our African ancestors and the exploitation that continues to go on right now, because these African these African nations and also these Caribbean nations are financially weakened by what happened to them. And they've never been compensated for it. Now, 2007. Activists demanded that Prime Minister Tony Blair, at the time Prime Minister Tony Blair of Britain, and Queen Elizabeth pronounce an, apol an official apology for the uh, slave trade. They refused to do this, even though slavery built Britain's economy. They refused to do this, okay? Now, there's a link to this article. It's an article from the star.com, the star.com called This is a Disgrace. This is a Disgrace. This is from March 8th, 2007. Now, 2000, um, 2007 was the, yeah, 2007 was the 200th year anniversary of, of Britain abolishing the international slave trade, meaning the importation of enslaved Africans into. Uh, Great Britain, okay, in England, Scotland, and Wales. It was the abolishment of that. The slave trade, the selling of slaves within Britain, within England, was allowed to continue until 1833 when that was officially abolished, okay? But uh, an excerpt of this article uh, talks, uh, it talks about um, um, a, a, a protester who said, this is a disgrace to our ancestors, okay? Let me back up. It says, um, uh, security and church officials hesitated, afraid to escalate a public relations disaster, okay? Uh, it says, steps from the queen, Queen Elizabeth II, spitting distance from Prime Minister Tony Blair and with his voice ricoch ricocheting, off the hundreds of statues and monuments in one of Christendom, Christendom's most famous edifices. A lone protester, a single protester, halted Britain's national service marking 200 years since the end of the slave trade. Now this, this article is from March 28, 2007, follow me. Everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page because you probably haven't heard anything like this all day today, okay? This is Michael M. Hotel. I'm the founder of the African History Network. I'm the, uh, I own and operate the African History Network fan page. Be, for, be sure to follow us here on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, okay? All right, because we're dealing with some real history. It ties into what you saw today. Okay, uh, and let me just post this right here, also here on the thread. How's everybody doing? Okay, and once again, happy birthday to one of my heroes. You see him in the back, Malcolm X. This is Malcolm X's 93rd birthday. OK, so um, it says as the commemorative service entered its most solemn portion in Westminster Abbey, Coronation Court, a uh, Westminster Abbey, Coronation Court to monarchs and burial ground to 3,300 of Britain's finest citizens. The protester, the single protest was who was a, a, a man of African descent in Britain. He brought the event to a halt. Security and church officials hesitated, afraid to escalate a public relations disaster. Which white man wanted to uh, be photographed hauling a black man out of church in handcuffs on the day the nation came to seek forgiveness for a practice the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, whose name was, uh, was Rowan Williams, had just called, quote unquote, the atrocity and universal sinfulness. So the protester's name was, uh, was Toyin Egbetu, uh, A-G-B-E-T-U. Toyin Egbetu had a royal audience and he gave them a piece of his mind. He said, this is a disgrace to our ancestors. He shouted, jabbing his finger at the queen sitting beside Prince Philip. He said, quote, millions of our ancestors are in the Atlantic. He said, a reference to the massive losses at sea aboard slave ships. He says, sorry is so hard for you, sir, because they won't even apologize. Some of the same ones you saw today 
Smiley won't even apologize for the transatlantic slave trade and, 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 and Great Britain's uh, part in it, okay? Now, everyone present knew that Prime Minister at the time, Tony Blair, had refused to pronounce an official apology for Britain's central role in the trade that enslaved as many as 20 million Africans in the colonies, cotton, tobacco, and sugar cane plantations. Okay, he said, quote, this is an insult. We should not be here. All you Christians who are Africans should walk out of here. Okay, uh, Toya Egbetu uh, said. Okay, and he said this before he eased out beneath the soaring 31 meter high arches. He was greeted outside the uh, Abbey by a small group of protesters chanting 1807 to 2007, 1807 to 2007, because 1807 is when uh, Great Britain ends the importation of enslaved Africans, the international transatlantic slave trade. So they're saying 1807 to this point in time, 2007. They said nothing's changed. 1807 to 2007, nothing's changed. And then he was arrested. This protested. Then he was arrested. Okay. Check out this article from uh, the star.com. All right. Now, some 2,000 eminent Londoners. Royals, diplomats, politicians, church leaders, and descendants of African slaves and British slaver, slavers had poured into Westminster Abbey uh, the previous day, uh, uh, poured into Westminster Abbey for, for the celebration, seeking forgiveness and healing from the horrors of the slave trade. Most passed through the Great West Door, where statues of 10 Great War figures, Martin Luther King among them, looked down on visitors to uh to this uh the queen's church okay but see this is why the 14 caribbean nations are suing great britain okay because they're not paying reparations and they won't even they, they won't even apologize for what happened all right so check out this article here uh this is from uh the star.com the star.com this is a um uk publication and this is called um this is a disgrace. This is a disgrace. This is written by Roy Royson James, uh, Wednesday, March 28, 2007. OK. All right. Share this broadcast on your own Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in. Hey, if you like very quickly, if you like this type of information, I'm going to post the information here on the thread of the broadcast. Be sure to register for the online courses that I teach. They're all on demand. We have them in a, 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 a 10 course bundle pack. You get 10 in the bundle pack. It includes Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. That is a 14-hour, uh, seven-session online course. It's all on demand. The whole bundle pack's on sale right now, $60, regular $130. There are 10 courses in the bundle pack, all right? Let's continue. You can watch from around the world. Let's continue. Okay, so if we go back to the article from news1.com. All right. And I sent this out in my email blast today. It's entitled Here's Why News One won't won't be covering one iota of the royal wedding. Much love to Meghan Markle, but we won't celebrate these colonizers. OK, so they said in 2007, activists demanded that Prime Minister Tony Blair and Queen Elizabeth pronounce an official apology for the slave trade. They refused, even though slavery built Britain's economy. So I just shared that article that they cited. However, outside of history, let's not forget that what people in the current royal family have done, like Meghan Markle's soon to be husband, Prince Harry. So in 2005, many people forgot Prince Harry attended a costume party as a Nazi. He was dressed up as a Nazi. He had a Nazi, he had the badge and Nazi swastika right on his, uh, right on his arm, okay? Although he was only 20 years old at the time, he, he um, he, he was grown enough to know the outfit was despicable, okay? Now, he's apologized for it. My question is, why would you do it in the first place? You, you think it was funny? That's, that's not funny, okay? Now, although Prince Harry had apologized and has done great work since then, according to this article from news1.com, he will always get the side eye from this vile, cost, from this vile costume. But it's not just a one-time incident for Prince Harry. Then there's Meghan Markle's soon-to-be relative, Princess Michael of Kent. In December of 2017, she was reportedly going to meet Meghan Markle for the first time and wore a Blackamoor-style brooch on her coat. 
Now, Black or More art depicts African people as, ex as exotic exoticized figures and is considered racially offensive. Oftentimes, they're either shown being subservient or they're shown as royalty, but it's largely looked at as being offensive. It's largely looked at as being similar to blackface, okay? Now, we know that the Moors were in Europe for 800 years and they were conquered by uh, Europeans after they brought Europe out of the Dark Ages and took the teachings from ancient Kemet, ancient Africa into Europe, okay? But you, but you have these battles that take place between the Moors and these Europeans and they're going to be expelled and they're going to some of them, some of them are going to be enslaved because, see, when they lose control of their last stronghold in Grenada, January 2nd, 1492, you're going to have some who flee. You're going to have some who are enslaved and taken into Spanish territories. Some are brought. Now, when you when you study this country here, we call the United States of America. Right. There was Spanish territory here before Jamestown, Virginia, 1607 was founded. So Florida and South Carolina was Spanish territory. The Spanish were taking Africans into the territory we call South Carolina in the 16, in the 1520s, the 1520s, about a hundred years before August 20th, 1619, Jamestown, Virginia. Okay. When that Dutch warship of 20 some odd Negroes, 20 some odd Africans comes in. It was actually an English warship, by the way. Uh, visit aaregistry.org, aaregistry.org. And, and check that out, dealing with August 2016, 19. It was actually an English warship. They said it was a Dutch warship, but it was actually an English warship, okay? So NYU described Blackamore art as gaudy by nature and uncomfortably dated, a bit like the American lawn jockey or ancient mima, Okay, because the American lawn jockey, that black jockey, that is making fun of and ridiculing African American jockeys who used to dominate horse racing. If you saw my broadcast from yesterday, you know that because I dealt with that yesterday. I dealt with how African American, well, that the 17th, it was, it was um, uh, May 17th, Thursday, May 17th, because May 17th was the anniversary of the first Kentucky Derby that was ran um, at, at Churchill Downs. Uh, it was ran May 17th, 1875, and the first winner of the Kentucky Derby was a 19-year-old African-American man named Oliver Lewis, because 13 of the 15 jockeys in the first Kentucky Derby, Kentucky Derby were black. We used to dominate horse racing. So you got to go watch that broadcast I did. Um, you can watch it at the African History Network, our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, click on videos. Or on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel, I M H O T E P on YouTube, Michael M. Hotel on uh, YouTube. Okay, check that out also because it's there. All right. Okay, so um, now in addition, Vanity Fair recently reported that uh, Atesh Tasser, an ex boyfriend of uh, uh, Princess Michael, uh, 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 ex boyfriend of the Princess uh, of Kent's daughter, said Princess Michael of Kent named her Black Sheep after Venus and Serena Williams. Uh, this, uh, this woman, uh, of course, invited to, uh, this woman was, of course, invited to the royal wedding, okay? So you can read some more, uh, you can read some more about that. I don't have time to get into the rest of this. All right, now, if we look at um, what happened when Britain abolished slavery, right? What happened with Britain about slavery? Now, it's important to understand some history here, okay? So, um, England gets involved in the transatlantic slave trade basically in about 1562, okay? Sir John Hawkins became the first Englishman to carry cargo of African slaves to the so-called New World. His voyage netted such gain, such profit, that Queen Elizabeth I, who had publicly denounced slave trading voyages, secretly invested heavily in Sir John Hawkins' subsequent slaving expeditions, okay? Sir Francis Drake, who was Sir John Hawkins' cousin, commanded one of these ships. And we know one of the one of, one of those first slave ships was called the Good Ship, it was called the Good Ship Jesus as well, okay? In the late 1560s, Sir John Hawkins sailed his ships into the port of Veracruz, on the Mexican coast, 
where he encountered a large and heavily armed Spanish fleet, which attacked and defeated the English vessels as part of their attempt to retain the monopoly over the northern transatlantic slave trade. So, this, so the Portuguese were the first ones involved in the transatlantic slave trade, right around 1440, the Spanish are right behind them. And you see Spain and Portugal are right next to each other, all right? Now, uh, okay, so uh, let me back up here. All right, so British interest in the slave trade did not resume for a century until after the English Civil War, when in 1672, uh, King Charles II, 1672, King Charles II charted the Royal African Company, the Royal African Company, which quickly established England as the world's greatest slave trade. Okay, that's 1672. By the 1700s, due to increasing demand, for African slaves, slave traders began to ship their cargo of Africans directly from Africa to North America. So even though you had the triangular trade, right, they're going to, because the, of the increased demand for enslaved Africans to get them to the final destination faster, they're going to, uh, a lot of times they'll ship them directly, transport them directly from Africa to North America. So to the Caribbean, to like Jamaica or something like that, to the uh, uh, Caribbean or into the British colonies, because this is the 1700s and you have the British colonies already established going back to 1607. OK, so this is some this is some background information dealing with the with the British slave trade. OK. Now, what takes place is, and that information is from uh, Gale, Gale, G-A-L-E, Gale Encyclopedia of U.S. History, Gale Encyclopedia of U.S. History, dealing with the Middle Passage, okay? Uh, you could probably go to encyclopedia.com, encyclopedia.com, because that's a free encyclopedia source, but it gives you references from all different types of encyclopedias, encyclopedia.com, all right? So if we look at what happens when um, uh, the when 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 Great Britain ends the slave trade, okay, let me just deal with that quickly here, and then uh, I want I want to deal with them uh, paying reparations, okay? What happened when they paid reparations? Because they paid reparations to slave owners, all right? Okay, so all right, so the compensation. Uh, let's see, which one I want to go to. All right. How's everybody doing? Hope, hopefully you're taking notes. Hopefully you're learning something. OK. All right. Um, OK, so we'll, we'll, we'll jump in with this right here. OK, so there's an article from AtlantaBlackStar.com. Britain compensated 46,000 slave owners. Britain compensated 46,000 slave owners, but will not pay slavery reparations. David Cameron builds Jamaican prison instead. Now this article is from September 30th, 2015. David Cameron, who at the time was the prime minister of Jamaica, was visiting Jamaica. There were growing calls for him to apologize for the transatlantic slave trade and to pay reparations, okay? Here's what the article said. British prime minister, David Cameron, is headed to Jamaica where he will discuss trade with the island nation and former British colony, okay? The, Jamaica was a former British colony and address, and address the parliament. Despite calls that the UK pay billions of dollars in reparations to Jamaica for the horrors of slavery, David Cameron reportedly will have none of it. However, although he will not atone for the sins of his country and enslaving Africans, the prime minister will build a prison in Jamaica. They will not atone for what they did in Jamaica, but they're gonna build a prison in, in Jamaica. So at the time, Prime Minister David Cameron does not believe apologies or reparations for slavery are the right, are the right way to go. As reported in the guardian.co.uk, the uh, UK publication, The Guardian. Already, the issue has dominated the prime minister's visit. Sir Hillary Beckles, chair of the CARICOM uh, Reparations Commission, 
and vice chancellor of the University of the West Indies, urged Prime Minister David Cameron to, quote, play its part in cleaning up this monumental mess of empire, play its part in cleaning up its monumental mess in a uh, monumental mess of empire, as many Caribbean nations are overwhelmed from the inherited mess of slavery and colonialism. So many Caribbean nations are dealing with high rates of poverty because they produce this wealth for uh, uh, Great Britain. But not only that, there was a decimation to their population because of slavery, because of the horrific conditions. And they were never properly compensated for this. They were never financially compensated for this. So Sir Hillary Beckel said, quote, we ask not for handouts or any such acts of indecent submission. We merely ask that you acknowledge responsibility for your share of this situation and move to contribute in a joint program of rehabilitation and renewal. OK, he wrote this in an open letter in the Jamaica Observer. OK, newspaper publication, the Jamaica Observer. He went on to say, the continuing suffering of our people is as much your nation's duty to alleviate as it is ours to resolve in steadfast acts of self-responsibility. OK, so the Jamaican academic, Sir Hillary Beckles, called the prime minister, quote, an internal stakeholder with historically assigned credentials, end quote. A, an, an internal stakeholder with historically assigned credentials, given his family's long history in Jamaica, okay? Sir Hillary Beckel said to us, therefore, you are more than a prime minister. You are a grandson of the Jamaican soil who has been privileged and enriched by your forebearer's sins of the enslavement of our ancestors, okay, he wrote, okay? Now, Sir Hillary Beckles also reminded Prime Minister David Cameron that quote, the Caribbean region was once your nation's unified field for taxation, theater for warfare, and space for the implementation of the trade law and policy. Seeing the region as one, seeing the region as one is therefore in your diplomatic DNA, and this we urge that you remember, end quote. Now, in March of 2014, CARICOM, which is an organization which is fighting for reparations for Caribbean nations, CARICOM unanimously approved a 10-point plan for slavery reparations. In its preamble, the plan asserts that European governments, number one, were owners and traders of enslaved Africans, including England, including Great Britain, like the, the opulence you saw today, the wealth you saw today comes directly from this. Two, instructed genocidal actions upon indigenous communities. See, we haven't even talked about the Mau Mau Rebellion in Kenya from 1952 to 1956, okay? And, and we know Kenya was one of the British colonies as well. Three, created the legal, financial, and fiscal policies necessary for the enslavement of Africans. Four, defined and enforced African enslavement and native genocide as in their national interests. Five, refused compensation to the enslaved with the ending of their enslavement, okay? Refused compensation to the enslaved with the ending of their enslavement. Six, compensated slave owners at emancipation for the loss of legal property rights in enslaved Africans. So Great Britain, compensated 46,000 slave owners when they ended slavery in 1833, but they didn't compensate those who were enslaved. There were about 830,000 enslaved Africans they set free. They got no compensation. Eight, I'm saying nine, imposed a further 100 years of racial apartheid upon the emancipated formerly enslaved Africans. That's eight. Nine, imposed for, for another 100 years policies designed to perpetuate suffering upon the emancipated and survivors of genocide. Ten, and have refused to acknowledge such crimes or to compensate victims and their descendants. So this is a 10-point plan that CARICOM laid out 
in March of 2014. Okay, and they and you have 14 Caribbean nations that sued Britain for reparations. Now, in July of uh, July of 2015, uh, this July of 2014. 14 Caribbean nations filed lawsuit against uh, Britain. I think they're talking about July 2015. 14 Caribbean nations filed lawsuits against Britain, France, and the Netherlands for slavery reparations uh, in the International Court of Justice in The Hague, H-A-G-U-E, The Hague, okay? Uh, 14 Caribbean nations filed lawsuits against Britain, France, and the Netherlands. Now, the suits target the nations for respectively slavery in the English-speaking Caribbean, Haiti, and Suriname, as reported by Al Jazeera America, okay? Uh, Dr. Robert Beckford, a British academic theologian, calculated that Britain extracted an estimated four trillion pounds, four trillion pounds from the Caribbean in unpaid labor. 2.5 trillion pounds in unjust enrichment to the British economy and an additional 1 trillion pounds in pain and suffering according to the Jamaica Observer. This amounts to a total of 7.5 trillion pounds of which Jamaica is owed 30.6%, 30.6% or 2.3 trillion pounds which is the equivalent to $413 trillion. Four is the equivalent to $413 trillion. All right. So this is, uh, all right. So check out this. Uh, so, okay. It goes on to say, meanwhile, when, um, hold on. Meanwhile, when Britain abolished slavery, they do this in 1833 the actual slave trade. It provided reparations, not to slaves, but 17 billion pounds in compensation to slave owners in today's terms. The compensation of Britain's 46,000 slave owners was the largest bailout in the country's history until the 2009 bank bailout, notes the Guardian, okay? So they, they compensated 46,000 slave owners but not the ones enslaved. So there's about 833,000 who uh, enslaved Africans who were free and they received nothing. Uh, and they picked up part of the tab as they were forced to work 45 hours of free labor each week for four years after they were supposedly freed as well. Okay. So re, uh, we're going to post the link to this article here on the thread of the broadcast. Read this article from AtlantaBlackStar.com. See, this is history, okay? And a people's history teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community, okay? So to understand why things are the way that they are, you have to understand the history and a history, a, se a, a sequence of historical events that lead up to a larger event taking place, all right? This is what we're dealing with. Okay. Hey, how's everybody doing? All right. Hey, share this broadcast on your own Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in. I'm Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, and writer. If you like this type of information, a few things you can do. Be sure to register for the online courses that I teach because we go deep into this. We have PowerPoint presentations. We have video clips. They're all on demand. We have a bundle pack. We just posted it here on the thread of the broadcast. Uh, it's 10 courses in the bundle pack. They include ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, which is a 14-hour, uh, seven-session online course. I deal with thousands of years of history. We don't just deal with the transatlantic slave trade. We deal with the 800-year occupation of Europe. By the Africans known as the Moors, who did what ancient Egypt, they did with thousands of years of history. That bundle packs on sale right now, $60, regularly $130. It's all on demand, so you can watch it at your own pace. Okay. Also, if you like this type of information, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com as well. There's all of my uh, DVD lectures are there. We have audio podcasts of our shows. 800 audio podcasts, interviews with a lot of our scholars like Dr. Leonard Jeffries and Professor Kaba Kamene, some of the people you see in Hidden Colors. 
Um, and you can read all of my articles there also, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, okay? All right, let's continue here. All right, so that was the article from uh, AtlantaBlackStar.com. Britain compensated 46,000 slave owners but will not pay slavery reparations. David Cameron builds Jamaican prison instead, okay? All right, so then um, you have uh, this article from theguardian.com, British history, slavery buried, scale revealed, okay? And it talks about how the Slavery Abolition Act of 1833 formally freed 800,000 uh, Africans, about 800,000 Africans, uh, who were the legal property of British slave owners. What is less well known is that the same act contained a provision for the financial compensation um, of the owners of those slaves by the British taxpayer for the loss of their property. The Compensation Commission was, was the government body established to evaluate the claims of the slave owners and administer the distribution of the 20 million pounds the government had set aside to pay them off. That sum represented 40% of the total government expenditure for 1834, okay? So the 20 million pounds that the government set aside to pay off these slave owners represented 40% of the total government expenditure for 1834. It is the modern equivalent of between 16 billion to 17 billion pounds. Now the compensation of Britain's 46,000 slave owners was the largest bailout in British history until the bailout of the banks in 2009. Not only did the uh, uh, slaves receive nothing under another clause, of the act, they were compelled to provide 45 hours of unpaid labor each week for their uh, uh, for their former masters for a for a further four years. Okay, for a period of time of four years after their supposed liberation. In effect, the enslaved paid part of the bill for their own manumission. In effect, the, these former slaves who had to work uh, who had to who, who then had to work 45 hours a week for four years. And doesn't say here that they got any compensation for this. They were basically paying for their own manumission, paying for their own freedom, which is similar to sharecropping. When I mean, you study the history of sharecropping after slavery ends in 1865, okay? So check this one out also. Uh, this is a deep one. Uh, I just shared a couple of paragraphs with you. I don't have time to get deep into this. This is from theguardian.com. The history of British slave ownership has been buried now its scale can be revealed. The history of British slave ownership has been buried. Now its scale can be revealed. Okay, we're gonna post this article here on the thread. Read these articles, okay? Now, when your children have, um, in school, when they have uh, current events, because I remember when I was taking world history in 10th grade, Cass Technical High School in Detroit, 10th grade, every Friday, world history class. I didn't like world history when I was in school because they taught it from a white perspective. We had current events. We had to read the newspaper. Back at that time, the newspapers, we had internet, okay? We, <laughs> we had to read the newspaper, bring in three articles of current events to talk about, right? Have your kids taken some of these articles. Oh, it's going to be a good conversation. Have your kids taken some of these articles. Have, have your kids... <laughs> They should take in the article from news1.com that says, here's why News One won't be covering one out order of the royal wedding. Much love to Megan, but we won't celebrate these colonizers. They should say, we're not going to celebrate these colonizers, okay? They, they, they should, I'm serious, they should do that. This is current events. We're dealing with history. They should do that, okay? All right, now, um, okay, so we, we posted that one. Uh, the history of British slave ownership has been buried. Now its scale can be revealed, okay? I, um, that's from theguardian.com. All right, now, there was another one from theguardian.com. When will Britain face up to its crime against humanity? When will Britain face up to its crime against humanity? This one was from March 29th, 2018, just a couple months ago, okay? March 29th, 2018. 
After the abolition of slavery, Britain paid millions in compensation, but every penny of it went to slave owners and nothing to and, 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 and nothing to those enslaved. We must stop overlooking the brutality of British history. Now, in all the coverage you saw today, this stuff that I'm sharing with you today did not come out. OK, the wealth, the splendor, the opulence that you saw displayed today in England, the way they able that. That came from the exploitation of our ancestors and the enslavement of them, and then the and then the colonial period that takes place after slavery ends. All right, now, um, okay, so we talked about Prime Minister David Cameron in Great Britain in September 2015. The Guardian.com has an article from September September uh, 30th, 2015. Jamaica should move on from painful legacy of slavery, says David David Cameron. Jamaica should move on from painful legacy of slavery. Okay, British Prime Minister ducks official calls for UK to apologize for its role in the slave trade or pay reparations. All right, and it says David Cameron has called for Jamaica and the United Kingdom to quote unquote, move on from the deep wounds caused by slavery, but ducked official calls for Britain to apologize for the role, uh, for its role or pay reparations. Okay, so we talked about that, but I just, but this is an article from the, uh, from the guardian.com. So I'm gonna share it with you. All right, now, um, where is that here? Okay, so we'll post this article here. All right, cause this is the guardian as well, okay? And this is a UK publication. These, 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 these are white people in England telling you this. All right, he's, he, he said they should just move on. Okay, interesting. All right, <laughs> All right. now uh, there's one other one here. Okay, this deals with the Caribbean nations and uh, let me see. There was one with a video in it. I was debating whether or not I should show you the video. Let me take a look at this here. Um, I right, just give me a minute here. Okay, so I think this is it here. Okay, is this it here? I think so. Okay, yeah. Let me show you this video. Let me show you this video right quick. All right, this is about two minutes, and this deals this deals with uh, this deals with the history of what we're talking about. So let me uh, I'm going to show you this video. I got to flip over because we're using Crowdcast, so I can actually show you. Uh, I can actually show you what I'm looking at here. And we use Crowdcast when I teach the online classes also. We'll come to some of your comments here in just a second. James said, let's talk about the hidden history, Queen Charlotte. I'm gonna do a separate, um, I'm gonna do a separate broadcast then with Queen Charlotte. I have information on Queen Sophia Charlotte. Uh, I'll do a separate, I'll do a separate one dinner with uh, Queen Sophia Charlotte. Talked about her at the very beginning. Uh, Angie said uh, that the price Harry may pay being born second, being caught publicly racist. This is the penalty as a black sheep never to ascend to the throne. Yeah, he's sixth in line. Uh, Randolph said right on my brother, teach them. Okay, so let's see here. So that is... Uh, that's the video there from the Guardian. I wanted to, I wanted to share that with you because that gives that brings all this together. Okay, it shows how the the wealth that you see in England, <laughs> where that came from. All right, uh, Howard asks, how can you get one of these shirts? Okay, so um, Power in One clo PIO Clothing dot com, PIO Clothing dot com sells these shirts. I know those brothers. I think they're out of uh where are they out of the DC area? 
and uh, they're going to have to give me an endorsement deal because every time I wear this shirt, man, people ask about it. PIOclothing.com, okay? <laughs> All right, now, we're going to continue here in just a minute. Hey, if you like this type of information and you want to support the African History Network and what we do, uh, you can uh, donate to the African History Network if you like, paypal.me uh, forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me me forward slash the AHN show, okay? And uh, you can donate there to the African History Network, $5, 10 15 50 $100, whatever. That helps us to keep doing the research, pay the bills, keep broadcasting, stay on the air. And I also do a Sunday night show on 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation WFDF out of Detroit. So if you check us out on Facebook, we broadcast that show We're on the radio, but we broadcast on Facebook Live also every Sunday night, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then also I have a uh, we have all my DVD lectures at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We have an eight DVD Black Panther bundle pack, an eight DVD Black Panther bundle pack as well right now where you get uh, two of my lectures done with the film Black Panther. You get three documentaries like 1804 dealing with the history of the Haitian Revolution, uh, Elementary Genocide Part 3, dealing with fighting against the school-to-prison pipeline and taking control of African-American children's education. I'm in that documentary. Also, you get Black Friday Part 2, which deals with practical strategies for economic empowerment. I'm in that one as well. You get some of my other presentations also. So that's on sale, regularly $130, on sale $80 right now, okay? That's at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Right on the homepage, we'll be posting the link here on the thread of the broadcast as well. Okay, um, and then this one right here, uh, we're gonna go to this after we go to some of the comments. This deals, this is from uh, dailymail.co.uk. Yeah, so The Guardian is theguardian.com. Daily Mail, that's another UK publication that I read. That's dailymail.co.uk. This deals specifically with uh, the 14 Caribbean nations suing Great Britain. We're gonna come to this in just a minute. minute. Let me go to some of your comments. How can you set up a recurring? So, Deb, so if you all want to set up a recurring donation, when you click on that link that I post at paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, right? It gives you an option to set up a recurring donation. Okay. So if you don't, you don't have to set up a recurring donation, but it helps uh, a lot if you like this type of information. It helps. We broadcast regularly throughout the week here. And we have uh our archive, we have hundreds of uh, uh videos broadcast here in our archives also on our fan page the african history network click on videos you'll see me as well as dr boyce Watkins. he broadcast on our channel also and then uh also if you go to our youtube channel michael m hotel on youtube uh we have i think it's like 700 videos there okay um michael m hotel on uh youtube okay and then also at our website africanhistorynetwork.com we have um uh, 800 is about 850 audio podcasts of um, our various broadcasts. And we're also on iTunes, the African History Network show on iTunes as well. And we're on Stitcher and uh, CastBox, different places where you get your uh, podcasts, okay? If we're not somewhere that you get your podcast, inbox me here on Facebook or email me at uh, info at africanhistorynetwork.com. OK, and let me know where you get your podcast and say, hey, you're not where we get our podcast. OK, and some of these other uh, some, some of the services I don't know about. So we'll see about getting on there. OK. All right. So let's continue here. Uh, let's go to some of your comments. Uh, uh, Bala said, uh, have the home of Kunta Kente, have the home of Kunta Kente, the Gambia. OK, yeah, it's in the Gambia region. That's where Kunta Kente was from. Robin said, please. Uh, Peace and blessings, Harry and Megan. Okay. Uh, Deb said, uh, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So if you want to give a recurring donation, you can. That helps out a lot. Uh, I'll be in New, I'll be in the Newark, New Jersey and New York area this coming uh week. Uh was at Tuesday, uh May 21st, Tuesday, May 22nd through uh Thursday, May 24th. Uh, I'll be in Atlanta June 15th through the 17th for the uh, big Juneteenth celebration. I'll be speaking there. I'll have a vendor booth there also. We'll have, well, as soon as I get the flyer, we'll put that on our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, Lise, uh, Lise Ann uh, said, why do you 
uh, why do you blind sisters and brothers keep saying this is a new time and don't condemn uh, these colonizers? Lonnie said, this is so utterly confusing. If I wear a weave and fight oppression or protest, am I still fighting oppression? Or does my weave cancel out my work in the community? Your weave doesn't cancel out work in the community, but we also have to understand European standards of beauty. And we have to understand uh, why, uh, we, we, we have to understand European standards of beauty. And we have to understand that for hundreds of years, African-American women were taught that their natural hair texture and natural hairstyles were not beautiful. So they did everything they could do to straighten their hair and so in some cases, lighten their skin. African-American men did the same thing. African-American men wore conks. We talk about Malcolm X. This is Malcolm X's birthday. You, if you saw if you saw the film Malcolm X, you saw Malcolm X and Shorty Jarvis with their conks. They use conch, they, you know, conchaline, OK, to straighten their hair. OK. So we have to understand that we're all going through a 12 step recovery process, recovering from the uh, uh, the side effects of white supremacy and racism. We're all going through a 12, 12 step recovery process. Some of us are on step 11, some are on step 10, some are on step two, some are on step negative 10. OK, some some people uh, are confused about what racism is in the first place. Racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race, which comes out of the ideology of white supremacy. Racism occurs when one race of people control the majority of the wealth, power, resources, benefits, privileges, land, access to education, access to opportunity, and they use that to marginalize, subordinate, and do harm to another race of people. If you read my articles, I write articles also at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can read all my articles there, and I have articles that do. I have one article. Uh, entitled White Racism Versus Black Racism. Most people are confused about what racism is. And I go through and break that down, okay? Um, okay. So, and then, so what happens is when you see in the 1960s, the late 60s, early 70s, when African-Americans were wearing Afros, the reason why is because this comes out of the Black Power Movement. They were studying their history, studying their culture, it was reflected in the way they dressed. It was reflected in their language. It was reflected in their hairstyle. So they were embracing their African features. They're embracing their Africanity, embracing their natural hair textures. So the so, so the palms and wearing the wigs and all this stuff was falling to the wayside, and we were embracing this because the what we were reading and the imagery that we were seeing was making us feel comfortable with our African features, and we were embracing this. It became a new standard of beauty, okay? And then that fell out of style because we understand the, the white control media is working 24 seven, right? And then so people go back to the perms, things like this, okay? But even the term perm, perm is short for permanent. So the question, now this is not an attack on African-American women, well, we have to understand how European standards of beauty are, are, are used to cause us to acquiesce. OK, so when African-American women are thinking about going natural, one of the uh, uh, wearing natural hairstyles, one of the questions they ask is, will they will African-American men still find them desirable or will men still find them desirable? They worry. They worry about that because we have men have been conditioned to want a European standard of beauty, light skin, long hair, curly hair, hair that looks like she's, you know, uh, Hispanic or Dominican, but I don't mean dark skin Dominican, I mean the lighter skin Dominican, okay? Um, so we're all, we're all suffering from this. So your history and culture gives you your foundation, it gives you your VIPs, your values, your interests and your principles. OK, and it's, your, and it's your history and culture, your values, your interests and principles that acts as a immune system, acts as a protection that helps you fight against this. It influences the way you think, feel, act and behave. OK, your values, your interests and principles gives you your VIPs. And this influences the way you think, feel, um, act and behave. All right. OK, let's go to uh, some more of your comments. So weave braids and with uh, I'm not I'm not I'm not a fan of uh, fake hair at all. 
you can do what you want to do as you gain more information is going to change the way you wear your hair uh chanel said let's see how they move in the world of foreign policy and the amount of people in africa that are in power that will support their agenda uh uh all because she is a mixed breed no different in terms of how they used uh the obamas in kenya and libya all right uh Lonnie said, don't you think that people who are on step one or, or step negative 10, as you say, are discouraged from moving forward on the path to unity amongst each other? If people are like Boyce Watkins are so condemning. Um, well, Boyce is um, so condemning and demeaning. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what Boyce said that was condemning and, and demeaning. I know Boyce. Boyce loves black people. He just gets frustrated with stupidity. I know Boyce personally. Boyce loves black people. He's trying. He's doing. He's sacrificing. It's for instance. I know Dr. Claude Anderson personally. Dr. Carl Anderson is one of my people. Dr. Claude Anderson is is tired of dealing with Negroes too. He's frustrated. So, for instance, Dr. Boyce Watkins, Dr. Boyce Watkins and Dr. Claude Anderson have their um, financial empowerment tour and they're going to different cities. Right. It's not free from them to put this tour. on. So they were in Chicago. It costs it costs Boyce ten thousand dollars to book the uh, I think they were at the Harold Washington Center there in Chicago. I've been there before. It cost them ten thousand dollars to book the Harold Washington Center. They had to spend another ten thousand for travel, accommodations, all types of expenses, all this stuff. This when they put on things like this, it's not free, okay? So because of how much they spend to put on these events, right? They have to charge admission. They can't do it for free because they're not taking corporate donations. They have to do it for free. Well, well, a lot of African Americans don't want to pay because they say this stuff should be free. Now, a lot of times, now I'm not talking about the ones who just don't have the money to go. I'm talking about the ones who spend $20, $30 on lottery tickets a week or $20, $30 maybe a day on lottery tickets, okay? Who spend that money in two days on fast food. I'm talking about the ones who had that, who had, who the same ones who say this stuff should be free will blow that money, okay? So I talked to Boyce and he said, look, he said they're gonna have to stop doing the uh ones they were doing like every other week or once a month in different cities because it's called, they're losing too much money now now they have the big um um the the uh the black national what is it called uh the all black national convention that's coming up in september in philadelphia this year i'll be there i was uh there last year in louisville kentucky i was one of the panelists i was on a panel discussion dealing with uh reparations and white supremacy and racism so I'll be there again this year. OK, so boys, you know, uh, boys loves African-Americans. He loves black people. He's working hard. He just gets frustrated with stupidity. OK, so when you hear him say certain things, he's frustrated with stupidity. But I talked to him about this, man. They're losing up. They're losing a lot of money because you have all you have a lot of black people who say, oh, these th this event and all this stuff should be free. It's not free for them to put that stuff on. They're spending thousands of dollars. To put that stuff on to try to help. Now, these same people, these same black people who say, oh, th th this event that you're doing with Dr. Carl Dennis should be free. They won't call Comcast and say Internet service from Comcast will be free. See, they'll pay the Comcast bill every month because Comcast will shut this stuff off. They won't call Sprint and say, oh, cell phone service should be free because if they don't pay the bill, Sprint will shut them off. They won't call Verizon. Now, all these are multi. All these are corporations that have billions of dollars. They can afford to give them something away for free. OK, African-American owned businesses, boys, Dr. Kardashian, they can't afford to get stuff away. The people who can afford to get something away for free. Black people won't go and tell them, give me this stuff for free. They won't say Comcast, give me my reparations. They'll try to get it from a black owned business. See, so we get we get we get pissed off by stupidity like that. OK, I get pissed off by it also. We get pissed off by stupidity like that. OK, at the same time, Boyce employs African-Americans. So how can you say, well, black owned businesses should hire black people? OK, but then you want them to get their services away for free. Well, where the hell you think the money's coming from to pay these to pay these employees? You think they're there 
for for charity you, you think they're just volunteering so so we so all three of us dr carl anderson Boyce, and myself and there's some others we get pissed off by stupidity like that all right all right so so don't take don't take something personally that boy says all right okay uh linda said thanks for sharing okay she's uh oklahoma city is viewing sandy we'll get a couple more of your uh comments and i want to go to this article dealing with the 14 caribbean nations suing for reparations sandy said what about biracial people we get put out all the time about not being black enough it needs to be talked about okay you may want to talk you may want to talk so you may want to so sandy you could uh that's a good question um now it'd be good to have that conversation with somebody who's biracial because i wouldn't be i wouldn't be an expert on that because i ain't biracial so i mean that's something good to talk about all right and um uh, and even when you have uh say you have a situation like megan markle right one parent is, is African-American, the other parent is white. Uh, that child still needs to learn their history and culture. They still need to learn African history and culture, okay? Because see, when they've been indoctrinated with Eurocentric ideologies and, and think that they're white, that's a problem, okay? Now, I ain't, a, I ain't a big fan of interracial marriage. I'll just tell you that right now. You can do what you wanna do. I'm not condemning anybody, but you know, Ain't nothing a white woman can do for me. I'm, you know, it's, you see my shirt, okay? So, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm only, I'm only with sisters. I'm all for the sisters, okay? So that's, <clears throat> that's it. All right. Now you can do what you want to do. I'm not condemning anybody, but at the same time, we have to understand when you understand African history and culture, you understand the concept of building a nation and building strong families. And you understand our history, then you also understand that who you decide to marry, I'm not talking about love, because love is an emotion. People only started getting married for love in the last 250 to 300 years. Historically, people didn't get married for love. They got married to build empires. They got married to uh to have the next generation, to give birth to the next generation. They got married to build something. Love was something that came later. People historically did not get married for love. That's a Eurocentric concept, getting married for love. Who you decide to marry is also a commitment to your people. When you have an understanding of your history and culture, who you decide to marry is also a commitment to your people as well because this is the person who you're going to give birth to the next generation with so when we look at ourselves as part of a greater whole as opposed to just looking at ourselves as individuals we have a better understanding of that so your history and culture causes you to have a love for your people and it causes you to have when you the standard of beauty that you use is one coming out of your history and culture, not one coming from a colonizer imposed upon you. So you don't operate based upon a European standard of beauty. Your thoughts create feelings, your feelings create actions and behaviors, your actions and behaviors create results. Your thoughts create feelings, your feelings create actions and behaviors, your actions and behaviors create results. Okay. Uh, we'll get two more of your comments. So Angie said, even the Supreme Court upheld that European standard for discrimination in the workplace. Yeah, that's the U.S. Supreme Court. Well, look who's on the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, Charlotte, uh, Charlotte said, oh, it's going down. Um, and see, also, I encourage, I encourage sisters with, 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 uh, perms and weeds and things like this. Um, you you have to also look at the damage that this that that that's doing to your hair as well. This is why a lot of African American women are are going uh are moving towards natural hairstyles, okay? Because of the damage it does to your hair, the damage it does to your roots, things like this, okay? So check out some of the natural hairstyles. Check out some of the natural hair care 
um, expos that take place in your cities. I know Malika Cooper has some because I speak at some of hers. Um, go to uh, Natural Hair Care. I think it's naturalhaircareexpo.com. Okay. Um, let's see here. Okay. Brenda said Europeans came from Africa too. That's why they call it the motherland. Uh, we call it the motherland. Europeans don't refer to it as the motherland. Um, what you have to understand is that um, you, you're going to have uh, biological climatology. And you can do a DNA test and see the majority of their ancestry is European. You're going, you're going to have changes that take place because of the climate. You have biological climatology, okay? So if you want to say all, all human life originates in Africa, okay, you can say that, but all of them, ain't, all of them are not Africans because that's not their ancestry, okay? The orig the, where they originate at 300,000 years ago, where they originate at and their actual ancestry, and you can do a DNA test and prove it. Those are two entirely different things. So one of the problems is that African Americans, African people, just try to claim every damn body. You need, you need to stop. You need to stop doing that because everybody's not trying to claim you. You need to stop doing that. All right. So uh, DailyMail.co.uk had this article from March tenth, two thousand fourteen. Okay. March 10th, 2014, okay? And um, it's entitled, Britain is sued by 14 Caribbean nations. Britain is sued by 14 Caribbean nations for the damage it did through slavery, even though, uh, even though country was first, even though this country was the first in the world to abolish the slave trade, okay? So Britain was the first to abolish the slave trade in 1807, all right? Okay, so, uh, and it talks about the coalition meets in St. Vincent. Uh, targets are UK, Holland, France, Spain, Portugal, Norway, Sweden, Denmark. All these was um, slaveholding nations. Now, the other thing is, is to understand the uh, Berlin, the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 1885, where these European nations, about nine of these European nations meet in uh, Berlin and uh, they, they carve up Africa into colonies. This is 1884 and 1885. The reason why is because they had been beating, they had been killing each other for hundreds of years. They had been killing each other for hundreds of years. and um, fighting over, fighting over Africa. Okay. And also fighting over not just Africa, but also they're also fighting over the Caribbean and things like this, right? Haiti, Jamaica, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Honduras, Panama, the Caribbean and Central America. So they meet in Berlin. They divide Africa up into colonies. They redraw the geographical boundaries of these nations. They redraw them around the areas that have the natural resources that they wanted, okay? So the most of the geographical boundaries that exist in Africa today, basically the, the 55 African nations, most of those geographical boundaries come from the Berlin Conference. These were boundaries created by Europeans and they are extracting the mineral wealth, extracting the resources out of Africa as well. So it's not just the decimation of the population through enslavement of Africa, but it's also the robbing of Africa of its mineral resources, the gold, the, the zinc, the diamonds, the silver, all the types of things like this, the tin, the tin, the rubber, the lumber as well. Okay. And this helps to fuel the industrial revolution. This helps to fuel the industrial revolution because you have the industrial revolution, you have the machinery that can mass produce products. And now because of colonization, you have almost an unlimited source of natural resources. So when, so, so when you look at African nations, when you look at Caribbean nations especially, and you see 
poverty. Now, all African, all of Africa is not impoverished, okay? Especially like in a lot of major cities. But what I'm saying is, is that when you look at certain African nations or when Trump refers to African nations and Haiti and Caribbean nations as S-hole countries, he doesn't talk about how Europeans robbed and raped Africa to put them in that predicament. He doesn't deal with that. Okay? So this, this is why you have to understand history. All right, now, I want to show you this here. This is, uh, okay, this is our email.co.uk, okay? This is called Britain is sued by 14 Caribbean nations. And let's blow this up. Okay, we got it blown up, all right? Britain is sued by 14 Caribbean nations uh, for the damage it did through slavery, even though uh, Britain was the first uh, in the world to abolish the slave trade, okay? So this is from um, May 10, 2014. More than 150 years after Europe abolished slavery, the Caribbean is preparing to sue Britain for its part in the wholesale trade of human beings. A coalition of Caribbean leaders will meet today in St. Vincent. This is in 2014 to discuss a landmark legal claim for reparations that could run into the hundreds of billions of pounds for a legacy that may still linger across the palm fringe uh, archipelago. A CARICOM, a group of 12 former British colonies, together with the former French colony of Haiti and the Dutch held colony of Suriname, believes Europe should pay for a range of issues spawned by slavery from poverty and illiteracy to ill health. Okay, so we talked about some of that, all right? And it talks about how um, uh, UK in particular should pay uh, the most, even though it was the first to abolish slavery in 1833. So this is a scene here from 12 Years a Slave. This is a scene from 12 Years a Slave. Um, in the public mind, the landmark claim comes as a pertinent time for the issue of slavery, just a week after Steve McQueen's epic 12 Years a Slave starring Michael Fassbender and Chiwetel Ejiofor won the Oscar for uh, uh, Best Picture in Los Angeles, okay? So, um, the case has been prepared by a British law firm that recently won almost 20 million pounds compensation for hundreds of Kenyans tortured by the British colonial government during the Mau Mau Rebellion of the 1950s. So the Mau Mau Rebellion is 1952 to 1956. They want to settle it, okay? Hundreds of Kenyans who were tortured by the British. See, that's not talked about as well. OK, this is during the colonial period of time. Then we know in the in, in the in the in the late 50s and the 60s, you're going to have these African nations gaining their independence from Britain and other nations, starting with uh, um, um, Ghana in 1957, with Kwame Nkrumah, and they gain their independence. And you're going to have this um, um, this um, the African liberation movement that takes place. OK. And speaking of African liberation, May 25th is African Liberation Day. May 25th is African Liberation Day. It's celebrated around the world, okay? And um, we'll talk about African Liberation Day in a minute because that is uh, a day that many African countries celebrate the hard fought achievement of their freedom from European colonial power. So May 25th is African Liberation Day. And we celebrate that here in Detroit. I'll be speaking at the Charles H. Wright Museum uh, for African Liberation Day on Saturday, May 26. Uh, okay, so today's claim, which also targets Spain, Portugal, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, comes at a pertinent time for the issue of slavery. Just okay, so we talked about over 10 million Africans were stolen from their homes and forcefully transported to the Caribbean as the enslaved chattels and property of Europeans, the claim says. The transatlantic slave trade is the largest forced migration in human history and has no parallel in terms of man's inhumanity to man, okay? Uh, so their letter continued, uh, this trade is, this, this trade is enchained bodies, this trade in enchained bodies was a highly successful commercial business for the nations of Europe. The lives of millions of men, women, and children were destroyed in the search of profit. Over 10 million Africans were imported into the Caribbean during the 400 years of slavery. Okay, so they, they so usually 
when they talk about 400 years of slavery, they're, they're dealing with in various nations, okay? Usually it was not 400 years in one particular nation. Slavery is going to end at different periods of time in different nations. Even here in the US, when you talk about the British colonies in the, uh, what we call the United States, you're talking about 246 years of slavery, you're not talking about 400. But even then, slavery is going to end at different times in the United States, okay? Because by the time the Civil War starts, April 12, 1861, you majority of the northern states had already abolished slavery and it's going to happen state by state so even in the u.s slavery doesn't all end at the same time uh as well okay all right let's continue all right so uh you can check this out this is a picture here big business by the 1660s big business by the 1660s the british involvement um had expanded so rapidly in response to the demand for labor to cultivate sugar in Barbados, which is British, a British colony, and uh, other British West Indian islands, that the number of slaves taken from Africans, taken from Africa in British ships averaged 6,700 per year, okay? And they're talking about by the 1660s because um, when we look at other information, we see uh, as it ramps up, we see at least 300,000 a year. But those are probably no low ball numbers as well. Cruel, cruel trading. Slavery ended throughout the Caribbean in the 1800s in the wake of slave revolts and left many of the region's plantation economies in tatters. OK, we know um, it ends in Haiti. Basically, um, they declared an independent January 1st, 1804. And that was a French colony, okay? But the but the Spanish and the British were also allies of the French uh, during the Haitian Revolution. Okay, Britain currently contributes about fifteen million pounds a year in aid to the Caribbean through department through Department for International Development uh, in a drive to further develop wealth creation. Okay, the subject of reparations has simmered in the Caribbean. For many years and opinions are divided all right let me see so this is one here uh shackled and chained this undated photograph shows slaves and chains uh on the island of zanzibar tanzania zanzibar tanzania in the 19th century uh shortly before slavery was abolished by britain okay so these enslaved uh, african men in the uh, 19th century the 1800s here's a migration the map shows the main transatlantic routes uh, out of Africa during the slave trade from 1500 to 1900, okay? And it shows them going to South America, shows them going to uh, North America, going to the United States, going to Central America as well. Okay, you can check this out. Here's David Cameron, uh, who's a descendant of slave owners. All right, so the subject of reparations has simmered in the Caribbean uh, for many years and opinions are divided. Some see reparations uh, as delayed justice while others see it as an empty claim and a distraction from modern social problems in Caribbean societies. Really? No, it's directly related. This, this, this is directly related to the conditions. Slavery ended throughout the Caribbean in the 1800s in the wake of slave revolts and left many other regions, plantation uh, economies in tatters. If the leaders decide to go ahead, a legal complaint will be filed against European states, possibly opening the way for formal negotiations. So they did actually sue, okay? I've been trying to find out what, what's happened, but they did actually sue, okay? All right, we'll come to a few more of your comments here in just a minute. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Hey, this is Michael M. Hotep. I'm the founder of the African History Network. Uh, I operate our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, and writer. If you like this type of information, be sure to register for the online courses that I teach. They're all on demand. As soon as you register, you can start watching. Okay, our most extensive one, we have a bundle pack of 10 courses, our most extensive one is called Ancient Kemet, which is one of the original names for Egypt. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. This is a 14-hour, seven-session online course. We deal with thousands of years of history. 
uh, deal with thousands of years of um, you know African history as well. And uh, it's all on demand, okay? I do a PowerPoint presentation also. We deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors also. Uh, we deal with uh, ancient Egypt. Uh, there's a lot of information that we deal with uh, in, the, uh, in the online class, okay? And uh, I'll show you a preview here in just a second. Uh, also included is uh, Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization. Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization. African American Resistance in the Era of Donald Trump, Voter Suppression, Reparations, and How Elections Have Consequences. Uh, those are just some of the uh, online classes. And then also, there's an a online class I did dealing with the film Black Panther, dealing with the film Black Panther also, okay? So all that's uh, in the bundle pack. We posted a link there. If you need me to post a link again, let me know. It's on sale. The bundle pack's on sale, $60, regularly $130. You can watch from around the world, your smartphone, tablet, um, uh, smartphone, tablet, computer. As soon as you register, you can start watching. All right, let me uh, show you this here. Okay, so yeah, some of you have heard me talk about this before. There was a um, there was a, a study from the Southern Poverty Law Center, right? That came out, and I first saw it uh, February of 2018. Uh, this is an article from the Atlantic.com. What kids are really learning about slavery? What kids are really learning about slavery? A new report finds that the topic of slavery is mistaught and often sentimentalized and students are alarmingly misinformed, okay? And it talked about how um, uh, 8%, they, they surveyed 1,000 high school seniors, 1,700 uh, uh, K through 12 social studies teachers. They found only 8% of high school seniors, only 8% of high school seniors could identify the Civil War as, could identify slavery as uh, the, the reason why the Civil War was fought, okay? Only 8%. Uh, fewer than one third, only 32% could correctly name the 13th Amendment as the formal end to US slavery. And um, only 35% thought it was the Emancipation Proclamation, okay? So 68% of high school seniors surveyed did not know that the uh, uh, 13th Amendment, it was a, a constitutional amendment that ended the Civil War, all right? So uh, this, uh, our students, and these are these are the, these are not just African-American students, these are students in general, okay? They're woefully being miseducated uh, about uh, the history of slavery. So this has a big impact on things today. This has an impact on policies, uh, the politics, the policies that are laid out, this has an impact on law enforcement, all this, okay? Um, when people don't understand your history, it causes them to have an insensitivity to your needs. So when you're trying to get your issues addressed, you're trying to get money for education, you're trying to get your issues addressed, largely people are believed, believe that African-Americans, the problems that we suffer from are, are, our, own, are, are our own fault and don't realize that these are the negative side effects, one of bad public policies, and two, uh, a legacy of slavery, 246 years of slavery, decades of Jim Crow segregation, uh, things like this, sharecropping system, convict leasing system, et cetera, all right? Some of the things we deal with in the online class, uh, we deal with uh, uh, what was the transatlantic slave trade, what were some of the events that led up to the transatlantic slave trade starting, uh, what role did Christopher Columbus play? Because Columbus is very important to understanding the transatlantic slave trade. When did Africans first come to the U.S. as slaves? Did Africans sell themselves into slavery? What were uh, were people in America before the slave trade? So what we have to understand is that African people have been in the land we call the United States of America at least 51,700 years. We were here before Native Americans came into existence. So, so the way when I deal with the transatlantic slave trade, I deal with it chronologically as opposed to episodically. And we got to deal with Dr. David M. Hotep's book, who wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence. And this book deals with uh, the African presence in this country. His book came out in 2011. I know him, he's a friend of mine. I've interviewed him about 12 or 13 times. And page 14 of his book deals with the African presence. Uh, discovered in Allendale County, South Carolina in 2004, okay? And uh, they found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints in lava, 
genetic M174 D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics. Um, they found all of this uh, paintings, skull, skeleton structures, and tools. So this was discovered by Dr. Albert Goodyear in 2004, 2004 in Allendale County, South Carolina, okay? So what we have to understand is that the people who, so yes, the transatlantic slave trade did happen, but we have to understand the chronology of events. African people, we've been here for tens of thousands of years, migrated from Africa. So you're talking about the Khoisan. The Khoisan have, have the oldest DNA on the planet. They come from Southern Africa, okay? Um, and they go all around the world, the Khoisan, they're the ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa. The Twa are derisively or pejoratively or negatively called in archaeology and anthropology pygmies. This is the Twa, they're derisively called pygmies, okay? And we're making voyages back and forth to Africa as well, because we've been sailing much longer than we've been told. Uh, there's an uh, African presence from ancient Egypt here as well. There were pyramid mounds built up and down the Mississippi River. So all this history. Now, Native Americans come into existence because you have Asians that come to this land around 3000 BC and the Africans and Asians intermix and their offsprings are who we call Native Americans. Because when you see old um, photographs of Native Americans, okay, like this one here from this book here, um, we'll blow this up here. This book here, Chronology of Native Americans, okay, uh, the ultimate guide to North America's indigenous people. Usually they were a darker skinned people, Native American, and they had high cheekbones also. They usually were not the very light skinned or almost white looking Native Americans you see today, okay? So if we look at this right here. Uh, now see, unfortunately, see the problem is, is that when we teach African-American history Normally in our schools, we deal with the last 500 years of history. We start with slavery or we may deal, we talk about Ghana, Shanghai, and Mali, things like this, right? They don't usually deal with the 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 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors who go in 711 AD because you got to understand that to understand Christopher Columbus. And Columbus was uh, was Columbus was was central and crucial to uh, laying the foundation for slavery, racism, capitalism, and the exploitation of indigenous people. The four voyages that Columbus goes on starting August 3rd, 1492, when he sets sail on the Nina de Pinta and Santa Maria. Now, African presence in uh, uh, North America 50,000 years ago. This is an article from sciencedaily.com. You can read it. You can pull up this article right now. It's called New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. New Evidence puts man in North America 50,000 years ago, okay? And this article deals with the discovery that Dr. Albert Goodyear made. So here's a picture by Dr. Albert Goodyear. He's a white archeologist, okay? And uh, he's an archeologist at the University of uh, South Carolina, all right? Um, and I posted the link here on the thread of the broadcast if you need it again for the, for the uh, online course bundle pack, okay? They're all on demand. It includes this, uh, these are some slides from the actual online course of ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. So it says, here's a summary of the article. Radio tests of carbonized plant remains where artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County by University of South Carolina archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, at least 50,000 years old, okay? Meaning that humans inhabited North America uh, long before the last ice age, okay? Now, what happens is when this type of information comes out, okay, um, the, when these discoveries are made, it totally flips the archaeological world upside down. And, and they keep having to push timelines back. They keep having to push dates back. OK, so the deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. So we deal with a lot of different archaeological discoveries that's taken place over the past few years because we deal with really about 300,000 years of history. OK, uh, we look at. Well, 
the, the previous thousand years of history. So what we deal with about 300,000 years of history. We deal with ancient Kemet, we deal with the discovery came out of Morocco in June or July, 2017 of Homo sapiens, skeletons of Homo sapiens found that date back 300,000 to 350,000 years ago, okay? Which totally flipped the archeological world upside down, all right? And, and all the news outlets had stories about this, New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, NBC, uh, National Geographic, they all, I've looked at articles in different news outlets when these discoveries come out. They all have articles about this stuff also, okay? But it's, it, it, but it's pretty quiet. You don't see a lot of it on the cable news, but you'll see it uh, in, in the uh, articles at their online websites, okay? So these are some of the things we deal with, all right? We deal with, um, we talk about the uh, the Moors, all right, who are descendants of the Garamantes. They go into the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal in 711 AD from Morocco, but you're gonna have waves of them going in. They also go in from West Africa as well, okay? And to understand how we got to this predicament, we have to understand uh, 1492, we have to understand what, what th their presence in Europe and the tensions and the fights that, and that, that develop and the hatred for the Moors that Europeans develop, okay? Because when they go in, these guys are looking, I mean, they looked at as almost superhuman, okay? They have, I mean, they introduce alchemy, what today we call chemistry, they call it an alchemy. They introduced the periodic table. They introduced, introduced spherical globes and almanacs, all different types of nautical instruments. Unfortunately, they introduced something called a fire stick, a fire stick. And this book right here is one of the best books dealing with the history of the Moor, Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertum. Mm -hmm. So this is one, we, we reference different books in the in my online classes. Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertum. So you have essays here from Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay, who's one of the baddest scholars on the history of the Moors. He used to teach um, classes at Temple University. Now he's at Berea College in Kentucky, he teaches classes on the history of the Moors. You have Renoko Rashidi, who has an essay in here, Dr. Wayne Chandler, Jan Carew, Dr. John G. Jackson. Okay, so it's a deep, deep book. Um, but they're introducing nautical instruments. Um, you know, Dr. John Henry Clark talks about how they reintroduced the concept of lot the, the concept of longitude and latitude. They're introducing all types of new musical instruments. Uh, the concept of changing your different type of clothing during the different seasons. In the warmer seasons, you wear lighter clothing, colder seasons, heavier clothing. They, the Moors introduces because Europeans were basically wearing a lot of the same clothing year round, if not the clothing year round. And they weren't taking baths either. This is the other thing. So when you study this, the 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 monks or the priests were said to be the cleanest people in Europe. And they took basically baths once a year. OK, Europeans were not taking baths. This is one of the reasons why uh, disease was running so rampant. Uh, throughout Europe. And when they go in also, the kings and queens in a lot of these kingdoms, right, throughout Europe, the kings and queens were not, uh, a lot of them were not living in castles, they were living in barns. The Moors are going to build castles. And as Moors get expelled out of certain areas, these Europeans take over these castles, right? So Professor Kaba Kamane, formerly known as Booker T. Coleman, is one of my teachers. And I just interviewed him. Uh, I just interviewed him um, uh, a couple of weeks ago. You can watch that uh, broadcast here uh, on the African History Network on Facebook and uh, on YouTube. Michael M. Hotep on YouTube. We talked about Kanye West comments about slavery and we dealt with history, history of slavery. We talked about the Moors as well. But he talks about how um, when you see movies like King Arthur, King Arthur and his knights and the courts and Robin Hood, things like this, right? You'll see a castle with a moat and the drawbridge and you see alligators, right? Well, historically, alligators were not in Europe because that climate is not conducive to alligators. That climate is not conducive to alligators, okay? But those, but a lot of these castles you're gonna see, these are gonna be built by the Moors. Also, the Moors are going to build, um, the uh, first university in, in Europe, University of uh, Salamanca in Spain, about 1285 AD. It's going to be African Moors and Arabs who build that. Because a lot of your first universities in Europe, 
University of Oxford, Cambridge, Toledo, University of Bologna, things like this, they're going to be created to study the teachings that the Moors take into Europe, all right? And these teachings are also going to lay the foundations for what we know as Freemasonry as well. OK, so you see something like this here and you see uh, uh, the, the Washington Monument, which is a Tekken. It's an ancient African symbol coming out of ancient Egypt, uh, ancient Kemet. But it, that comes from the story of Asar Aset and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis and Horus. Uh, Osiris, Isis and Horus. And there were about 1200 Tekken throughout, throughout ancient Kemet. It's a similar resurrection. There are only about 12 a day. But when we look at something like Freemasonry, right, the word Mason is derived from the Latin words mass and sun. And Mason means child of light and expresses the desire to pursue light, which is a metaphor for the sun, which symbolizes knowledge. The term child of light or sons and daughters of light was first used to identify students who had completed 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet. Many Masonic temples were modeled after the temples of Kemet, places where light or knowledge is imparted in a series of steps or degrees. So the concept of liberal, liberal arts comes from the teachings in these temples. Liberal arts colleges, getting your uh, credentials in a series of degrees, this is where this comes from. And we know that 50 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence also were Freemasons as well, okay? So, um, this is just a, a sample of the type of information we deal with, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, okay? Uh, so it's all on demand. You can register for that. It's all on demand. Uh, we have PowerPoint presentation, video clips, everything. It's a 10-course bundle pack. Uh, it's on sale right now, $60 regularly, um, $130. Let's go to some more of your comments here. Uh, the Moors were all that Charlotte said. Yep, the Dark Ages. Yeah, and the uh, the History Channel has a two hour uh, series. They have a two hour documentary called The Dark Ages. Okay, and they deal with some of this. But then that that was um, they also had a a multi part series called The Barbarians. This is about two thousand seven, two thousand eight. The Barbarians. And uh, if you go to history.com, which is the official website of the History Channel, you may be able to order it, okay? Or they may have it on their YouTube channel. And when they dealt with the barbarians, each episode, they dealt with one of the different barbarian groups, the, the Vandals, the Visigoths, the uh, Anglos, the Saxons, the Lombards, the Lombards, the Jutes, the Franks. So France is named after the Franks. England is named after the Anglos, okay? So you gotta you have to understand not just African history but also European history as well. Okay, so if you like this type of information, also if you want to, you can donate to the African History Network. Uh, PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show is a PayPal link we just posted here, or go to AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, click on the yellow donate button. So that helps us a lot. It helps us to keep doing the research, uh, broadcast, pay the bills, stay on the air, keep doing what we do. All right. If you want to set it up for a recurring donation, when you click on that link, it gives you the option to set up a recurring donation. Tracy said, uh, true, the Moors taught Europeans about hygiene. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Because disease was running rapid. The Moors are also going to introduce surgical instruments. They're going to introduce the standards that are used for some parts so for people to get the uh, credentials to be a physician. OK. The Moors, they were re removing eye cataracts. They're doing all types of surgeries, things like this. So the, the teachings that the Moors introduced into Europe save Europe and bring Europe out of the dark ages. And then they were paid as by enslaving us. You can sign up for our uh, email newsletter. Also, we send it out a few times a week. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828. Sign up for our email newsletter or go to AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Sign up there as well. Uh, Melvin said, yep, the Dark Ages. Uh, okay, we've got Charlotte. Dominique said, uh, Maritus um, uh, got its independence by selling uh, an African land to the British. Today, uh, British is saying it's the owner and it's sovereign. Uh, the thing is, they that many are talking about the land, but not about uh, not about the history of the Indian Ocean. Okay, uh, Charlotte said, "The deeper we dig, the blacker the planet gets." Yes, 
I heard original Indians were African. Yeah, well, African people are the original inhabitants of this land. Uh, we were in South America going back at least 56,000 years ago and uh, North America, the land, this land here, North America, uh, at least 51,700 years ago. We were here before the people we call Native Americans or the Indians came into existence. Uh, the fire stick. Yeah, so the fire stick was a long stick that fired one projectile. This is this is what the Moors introduced into Europe. This is going to be turned into the gun, right? So the first gun was produced in 1364, okay, 1364 AD, all right? Uh, if you go to pbs.org, public broadcasting system, pbs.org, and, and search for a uh, gun history timeline, they give a timeline of the history of the guns. It goes back to 1364. Okay. Yeah, so I just talked about the fire stick. And this is where the gun comes from. All right. This is what the Moors introduced. But the but it was it they would use it more for like celebration, things like this. But Europeans are going to turn this into the weapon and see what gave the Europeans uh, a dominance when it came to the to the slave trade was that they had guns. Now, slavery existed before that because you had the Arab slave trade of African people that goes back to seventh century AD, going back to about 650 AD, uh, seventh century to the 19th century, because Arabs weren't slaving Africans for hundreds of years before Europeans started enslaving Africans. And the Arabs are going to help Europeans uh, with the slave trade also. That's the other thing. That's something people don't understand. So if you look at the article from, um, um, AtlantaBlackStar.com, AtlantaBlackStar.com, 10 facts about the Arab enslavement of black people not taught in schools. This is from June 2nd, 2014. June 2nd, 2014 by uh, uh, A. Moore, it was a thing, it was Andrew Moore or uh, Andre Moore, I forgot, I interviewed him once before. 10 facts about the Arab enslavement of black people not taught in schools, okay? And they talk about number one, the number of people enslaved. The number of people enslaved by Muslims has been a hotly debated topic, especially when the when the millions of Africans forced from their homelands are considered. Some historians estimate between 650 AD and 1900 AD, 10 to 20 million people were enslaved by Arab slave traders. Others believe over 20 million. So I've heard estimates of 30 to 50 million. Now, Professor uh, Joseph Ben Levy told me about that. I've interviewed him a few times a few years ago. Um, others believe over 20 million enslaved Africans alone have been delivered through the Trans-Sahara route alone to the uh, alone to the Islamic world. OK, uh, if we go to number five. OK, if we go to number five, Arab slave trade ushered in the European slave trade, Arab slave trade ushered in the European slave trade. So this is why it's important to understand a chronology of history, okay? The Arab slave trade in the 19th century um, was economically tied to the European trade of Africans. New opportunities of exploitation were provided by the transatlantic slave trade, and this sent Arab slave traders into overdrive. New opportunities of exploitation were provided by the transatlantic slave trade, and this sent Arabs it, this sent Arab slavers into overdrive. The Portuguese on the, on the Swahili coast profited directly and were responsible for a boom in the Arab trade because the Portuguese on the uh, East Coast uh, in East, uh, East Africa, the Portuguese had a slave trade with the Arabs, okay? Meanwhile, on the West African coast, the Portuguese found Muslim merchants entrenched along the African coast as far as the Bight of Benin, okay, which is was Dahomey. These European enslavers found they could make considerable amounts of gold transporting enslaved Africans from one trading post to another along the Atlantic coast, okay? So you're gonna find also that the um, um, Arabs were helping Europeans with the slave trade as well, okay? Arabs were helping Europeans with the slave trade also. All right. Okay, so 
Uh, Ralph says, so why help these people? Okay, what people are you talking about, Ralph? Melvin said, PBS, a very good source for documentaries regarding history. Yeah, PBS also has a lot of good articles there as well, public broadcasting system. So May 25th is African Liberation Day, and it's celebrated nationwide, African Liberation Day. And uh, on African Liberation Day, May 25th, many African countries celebrate the hard-fought achievement of their freedom from European colonial powers, all right? So African Liberation Day is celebrated by many African communities around the world. It is a permanent mass institution in the worldwide Pan-African movement, okay? Pan-African movement. Pan-Africanism basically just uh, means that um, African people think that African people around the world should be united. They're gonna have differences, but they should be united. And they, uh, we need to reclaim African history, African culture, African spiritual systems, and also that the future of African people worldwide is interconnected and intertwined, okay? This is Pan-Africanism. The future of African people around the world is interconnected and intertwined as well. And we not only have a common history, but also a common destiny. Now, the day is observed in countries such as Ghana, Kenya, Spain, uh, Tanzania, uh, the United Kingdom, UK, and the United States, all right? Uh, some background information on African Liberation Day. Uh, it started out as African Freedom Day, African Freedom Day, and it was founded during the first conference of independent African states, which, attract, which attracted African leaders and political activists from various African countries. In Ghana on April 15, 1958, so this is the year after Ghana declared its independence. In Ghana on April 15, 1958, Government representatives from eight independent African states attended the conference, which was the first Pan-African conference in the continent, okay, or on the continent. The purpose of the day was to annually mark the liberation movement's progress and to symbolize the, the determination of the people of Africa to free themselves from foreign domination and exploitation, from foreign domination and exploitation. Between 1958 and 1963, the nation class struggle grew bigger. This is the African liberation movement, grew bigger in Africa and around the world. During this period of time, 17 uh, African nations, 17 African countries won their independence and 1960 was, pro was proclaimed the year of Africa. On May 25th, 1963, 31 African leaders convened a summit meeting to found the Organization of African Unity, the OAU, the Organization of African Unity. They met May 25th, 1963, 31 African leaders convened a summit meeting to found the Organization of African Union. So this is why May 25th is celebrated as African Liberation Day. They renamed African Freedom Day as African Liberation Day and changed its date to May 25th, okay? Because African Freedom Day was uh, April 15th, all right? So they changed it to May 25th. The founding date of the OAU is also referred to as Africa Day. African Liberation Day has helped to raise political awareness in American communities across the world. It has also been a source of information about the struggles for liberation and development, okay? So when you study Malcolm X, you study Malcolm X, right? And Malcolm X on June 28, 1964, announced the formation of the Organization of Afro-American Unity here in the US, the Organization of Afro-American Unity, that was patterned after the Organization of African Unity. Okay, that's where that came from. All right, uh, Amber says, so do you think Queen Elizabeth gave Africa Ebola because of their independence? No, I don't think so. Uh, Ralph, the Europeans, uh, the Europeans, the Moors help get out of the dark ages. Yeah, the Moors help the Europeans get out of the dark ages, okay? Uh, he said, well, so why did they help them? Well, the, when the Moors go in, this is before racism and white supremacy even exists, okay? And 
African people had a concept of this knowledge is designed to be shared. And they come, they come out of a culture where you have a overabundance and they're going into a culture where you have scarcity. So this is before waste racism and white supremacy, all that stuff even exists. Okay. All right. Jada, uh, Jada said, uh, what book you recommend for beginners to study metaphysics? Uh, I'm not sure what book to, to study metaphysics. You may, you may read um, something like um, uh, Stolen Legacy by George G.M. James uh, deals with uh, uh, Greek philosophy, stolen ancient African philosophy. All right, we got to get out of here. Hey, uh, once again, we'll post a link on the thread here of the broadcast. Uh, you can register for my online courses. They're all on demand. We have a bundle pack, only $60 for limited time only, regularly $130. It includes the one I was showing you uh, clips, uh, the slides from ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach in the school. Hey, I'm Michael M. Hotel. Thanks for tuning in. Share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Follow us here on Facebook, the African History Network. Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct your own behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. Right now it's correct your own behavior. It's not over till we win. Wakanda forever. We'll talk to you next time. Peace.